Um, good morning, guys. Uh, welcome to Houston. Uh, some of you guys are from Houston and the greater area. Uh, I Kenneth Wu. I'm one of the uh, one of the uh, uh, CMOs right now for the Sprint Center for Pain, and I'm still a adjunct UT professor at the McGovern School of Medicine. Uh, I'd like to thank the RSDA network for inviting me for this talk. Uh, my scope is limited to interventional pain management, but disclaimer is, as you guys know, CRPS is not only going to be treated with interventional pain, you definitely need multimodal therapy in, in order for you guys to feel better. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to get started. Um, I have no financial disclosures to make with any of my sponsors uh, today. Uh, I'm not paid to speak. This is just on my own time of volition. So now, this is a very, very good slide to start off with. How many of you feel like that? Okay, whole body on fire, limb on fire, um, you know, feel like this all the time. So. I got interested on treating CRPS when I was in fellowship as one of my first patients with Dr. Lubinow is a CRPS patient. Um, how many of you have been to the ED multiple times? Okay. How many of you guys got, felt like the ED physician were not listening to you or there are a lot of specialists that don't listen to you? Um, because a lot of doctors really don't know about CRPS. Um, it's a horrific neuropathic pain condition that seemingly is out of proportion to the injury and it causes significantly functional disability um, to limb, to whole body function, and it's generally refractory to a lot of medical management. There are other pain syndromes that pain physicians like myself treat, like diabetic neuropathies, failed back surgery syndrome, but generally they respond to neuro neuropathic pain medicines and or opioids or a combination of both, but CRPS patients generally do not respond as well and there has been associated with significant disability. Uh, I got passionate at treating patients like you guys because you guys are some of the most grateful patients uh, I have had, um, even if you guys get 30 to 40 percent relief. Um, same thing with cancer patients. So I really enjoy treating you guys. Now fast forward, uh, when I left the fellowship, um, I continued on um, as one of the interventional pain doctors at TIER, and I treated a lot of CRPS, both CRPS1 and CRPS2. And over the course of the years, I have refined the way I treated things, and I just want to summarize uh, what I do interventionally and hopefully tie in what a lot of Dr. Stetson have said and what uh, the pharmacists have said all in one slide. Okay. Now, I'm not going to belabor the point. Uh, CRPS is divided into CRPS1 and CRPS2. CRPS1 is generally in most 80, 90 percent of patients. They, ha they generally do not have a no neurological injury. Um, small things like what Dr. Sessas mentioned, like IV placements, um, tourniquet placement in the OR could lead to CRPS. Um, a good example um, you know, is what we call classic CRPS, right? Or small orthopedic injury period of immobilization, pain out of proportion, you start having color changes, you know, dystonia and other features. Now, CRPS2 or causalgia is directly related to nerve damage. You actually will have, um, you know, um, issues with the sciatic or the brachial plexus or spinal cord. A good example of CRPS2 that I've seen more at tier is my amputee patients, okay? Amputee patients who really do not have phantom limb pain, but their pain is not really related to the stump site itself, but they have some allodynia, color changes, and all that related uh, to the limb itself. They, that's CRPS2. Um, I also had patients with crushed pelvises where their entire sciatic nerve or crush. I have one gentleman that had a 300 pound I beam dropped on, on, on his pelvis during work and he has to have a heavy pelvectomy. So they took out his entire pelvis on the left side and he's left with re, uh, CRPS type two. Consequences, both CRPS1 and CRPS2 have significant pain that leads to guarding and disuse and ultimate contractures. So not only are patients in severe neuropathic pain, they have progressive functional limb loss all over time. This is a very good example of, uh, of, of somebody with CRPS1. Uh, with uh, acute CRPS, you can see the uh, arm uh, and the hand changes color. And in the radiograph, you actually have some regional osteoporosis on this side because of disuse. I'm not going to belabor the point. Dr. Setson has already gone over a lot of this stuff. Um, in 2011, uh, a group of physicians um, have met in Budapest to 
re uh, to redo the uh, criteria for CRPS, and it's that's why it's called the Budapest criteria. You have to have um, one out of the three uh, uh, patient report and at least one out of the two of these things on um, on physical exam. Now, the thing is, a lot of patients are dif diagnosed at different stages. You guys may have a lot of vasomotor and pseudomotor changes initially in acute CRPS, but sometimes I feel like patients are underdiagnosed because in chronic CRPS, you guys may not have vasomotor, pseudomotor changes that's clinically um, visible. Now, I agree with Dr. Stetson that thermal, uh, uh, thermal testing and QSART is able to detect some clinical, subclinical pseudomotor findings. Um, therefore, if I see a patient that had previous signs of pseudomotor, vasomotor on reports, even if they don't have it, I, and you ruled out other causes for neuropathic pain, I would still treat the patient like a CRPS patient, and they generally do respond. I love this phrase. Uh, so Donald Rumsfeld, a very, very good phrase. There are no knowns. There, these are the things that we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say there's things that we don't know, that we know that we don't know, and they are also unknown unknowns. These are the things that we don't know. The reason I put this slide in is because we know a lot of things, we don't know a lot of things, and it's important that you understand the mechanism of the next slide and everything will be tied together. So here we go. Now, this slide actually summarizes a lot of what I have to say. It summarizes what a lot of Dr. Stetson have said, um, and it will tie in together uh, afternoon lectures which uh, some of the physical therapists and occupational therapists will talk about. So let's talk about the known knowns, okay? So what is known is that a lot of times when you have trauma, you have autoimmune markers, or you know, the body senses itself being injured, it it creates a signal that sends these cells called the dendritic cells directly to the lymph nodes next to your tissue. What we don't know is why in CRPS patient there is a significant outpour of autoimmune mediators that disperses in the blood over here and it causes the nerves in your spinal cord to be hypersensitive it causes the sympathetic chain to be hypersensitive, which then causes a lot of vasogenic changes here. And it inputs back into the tissue to cause more pain. There's more atrophy when you disuse the limb and then this becomes a self-perpetuating cycle. And eventually, eventually, the process became a true central pain syndrome. So really quickly, peripheral injury leading to autoimmune or immunogenic markers to be sent in the blood. These autoimmune markers or the inflammatory soup get sent back to the nerves over here to make these nerves fire more and also sensitizes the sympathetic chain which is uh, extension of the central nervous system and eventually this becomes a self-escaping process where it no longer is dependent on the trauma. That's the proposed mechanism of why people have CRPS has spreads, right? It starts in one location, the spinal cord got sensitized, now the area spreads over time. The sympathetic chain over here is what's, caught, what's driving the color change, what's driving the pseudomotor changes, what's driving you know, the edema, what's driving all of that stuff. What we don't know is why in subset of populations, why this process starts and it's over-exaggerated in CRPS, okay? Um, that's why in some cases, okay, low-dose naltrexone works, right? Remember the slide before where the other presenters has talked about, you know, autoimmunity or immunoinflammation of nerve cells. These nerve cells are hypersensitive, okay? So low-dose naltrexone fits into the picture very well here, you know, right? Or vitamins and, and, and um, other GI nutritional supplements, it really downtones the auto immune markers here, so it may play a role in decreasing the CRP as pain. What I do is obviously working on the nervous system as an interventional specialist, but I want you guys to know this slide because this really has everything in one slide. It's a, it's a really, really good summary slide, okay? So, just to summarize, you have injury, 
You have inflammation here leading to this, leading to peripheral sensitization, which means your nerves over here are hypersensitive to stimulus. It causes your spinal cord and brain to change. Then it self-perpetuates. You have disuse and atrophy, which means you don't use your limb. It becomes contracted. You lose limb, you lose limb function, ranges of motion, and you have functional disability. Does that make sense to everybody? So again, self-perpetual cycle happens even after injury has gone away after a couple of months, right? Initially after the injury, your tissue heal, but you have this perpetuation of pain due to inflammation driving this, peripheral sensitization, central sensitization at the level of the spinal cord, and atrophy. Atrophy leads back to inflammation. Why is that? When you do not use your limb, your muscles contract. It gets smaller. Now when you try to use your limb and try to weight bear, even normally, you create microtrauma. Microtrauma leads to more inflammation. Boom. Now you have created a self-perpetuating cycle. That is a theory of why people with CRPS has persistence in pain even after injury. Now, interventional pain management is directed at treating this vicious cycle to break the pain cycle. So just to go back, I work on this area, the peripheral sensitization, the central sensitization. Atrophy is worked on by physical therapists after your pain is controlled to break this cycle. Inflammation is all the microglial cells, the low-dose naltrexone, the micronutrients, the vitamin stuff that Dr. Stetson was talking about to reduce inflammation. The more part of this cycle you can break, the more likely your CRPS is going to be in remission. Does that make sense? I only treat these two things as an interventional pain specialist. That's why you need other specialists to help you. Physical therapy is very, very important to prevent atrophy. Micronutrients, um, you know, anti-inflammatory compounds can help you with this inflammation response. So if you can block off all four of these, you have a very big likelihood of putting your CRPS into remission and regain function and decrease pain. Make sense, guys? So. Interventional pain management, like I said, are directed at one or more aspect of the cell perpetuation of CRPS with goals to break the pain cycle. So I'm combat support. I'm not the main, uh, I'm not the main guy, really. I'm just trying to help break one aspect of the uh, vicious cycle. Okay. Now, let's talk about the interventions, um, and I'll try to go through each one of them, and I'll tell you the good and bad um, and ugly uh, about each interventions. Um, and try to uh, summarize it uh, as quickly as I can. So let's start talking about the sympathetic nerve block. Uh, many of you must have had this if you guys have been treated by interventional pain specialists. The sympathetic nervous system is outside of the spinal canal, and what we wanted to do is we want to break this up to decrease sensitization of these nerves. In general, it works for patients with early CRPS, with color changes, swelling, and other things I can see. So if you're diagnosed typically within one year who still have a lot of peripheral markers uh, that are positive, so allodynia with color changes or allodynia with um, um, edema, you guys generally will respond to sympathetic blocks. Now, unfortunately, not, there's no one case I've seen with one sympathetic block, the pain is completely remission. You need a series of three to six injection at one to two weeks apart. That's sort of my treatment cycle based on that. And that is because you want to block the sympathetic chain enough where it goes back down to normal. And usually with one injection, my efficacy rate is very low. But after a series of two or three, um, you gen most of my patients generally see duration extension. Right? So the first block may work uh, for about a you know, couple of days. The second block works for a week or two, third block, you may, you may have a month of relief or longer. As long as you're seeing this duration extension per block, I continue. Now, if I do three and you're still, you know, three days of relief, four days of relief, I do not do any more blocks because I do not believe any more block is worthwhile. Do not let your doctor keep doing, you know, 10, 20 blocks on you. If you do not get some degree of duration extension um, by the third block, that usually means that your CRPS 
may not just involve mainly the sympathetic chain, it may have some central process. Remember I said early CRPS is more peripheral. Once you get to chronic CRPS, you have more spinal cord and brain involvement with central sensitization. Make sense so far? So I only put in local anesthetics by itself. I do not put in steroids. I do not put in anything else, okay? Steroids have very limited benefit on sympathetic blocks. It really doesn't do anything, um, in my opinion. And they did that only benign use of steroids. There's no, there's absolutely no evidence on doing sympathetic blocks. Um, I use, I usually use a very dense um, local anesthetic. 0.5% bupivacaine is what I typically use. Um, I put a little epinephrine inside to make sure I don't go intravascular, um, but I don't put any um, steroids in, in my blocks at all. So very good question. So this is, again, this is my personal opinion. Early CRPS is patients who still have color changes or, or visible um, things that you can see on exam is early CRPS. Uh, late CRPS is usually on patients that just complain of pain. They don't have any pseudomotor or vasomotor changes, okay? Early CRPS has more peripheral things going on. Late CRPS is all spinal cord and brain. Okay, so that's how I make the differentiation. Now, is there a timing? Yes, most of the time if you're diagnosed in less than a year, maybe a year or two years, some CRPS patients still have peripheral color changes, edema and pseudomotor, then you guys are responsive generally to um, sympathetic nerve blocks. If you only have pain or the CRPS spread to the whole body, I typically do not do sympathetic blocks unless I see color changes again. So many of you guys may flare, during, during uh, chronic CRPS, when you're starting to develop color changes again on your limbs or on an area, then I would do sympathetic blocks to treat the flare. But I do not block chronic CRPS patients because you need a target, right? If your whole body, then these blocks are not efficacious, okay? So different parts of, of, of the sympathetic chain is blocked. Uh, Stellate ganglions for head and neck CRPS, upper extremity CRPS. For for truncal CRPS, uh, which is a little less common, um, you can do thoracic sympathetic blocks. Lumbar sympathetic blocks are for your lower extremity CRPS. And I have some chronic pelvic CRPS that, um, that some of the GYN surgeons had uh, complications during uh, GYN procedures like vaginal tapes and stuff, and they have, I have a few of these. They respond to ganglion vent part, which is the very bottom of the sympathetic chain. Um, so this is just a schematic. Um, so stellate is on top, um, you know, the ganglion is sitting in front of the spinal canal. Um, you block it in the neck. Um, some of the complications include intravascular injection. Um, you can have inadvertent epidural spread, so it may make your arm a little bit weak. And it will cause a droopy eyelid, okay, because Horner syndrome is part of blocking the sympathetic chain. So I usually use droopy eyelid as a success sign after the block. So if you have a droopy eyelid or your blurry vision on one side, you get a successful stellate ganglion block. If you don't, you may not have the relief you need it. Um, thoracic um, sympathetic blocks, um, a little bit more technically challenging because there are ribs and there are lungs on each side. I usually do this under ultrasound as opposed to uh, fluoroscopic guidance. Um, you want to make sure you stay away from the lung field when doing this um, or else you can cause pneumothorax, okay, which means a punctured lung. Lumbar sympathetic block is obviously um, in the lumbar region. Um, you, um, you, you can block uh, the sympathetic chain right here. Um, intravascular injection is definitely one thought. Um, some of the other more uncommon complications due to lumbar sympathetic block is general femoral neuralgia. So lumbar sympathetic chain sits in front of a, a, a nerve uh, called the genital femoral nerve, which provides sensation to your growing, and sometimes it can be injured or injected um, during these blocks. It's uncommon, but I've seen it before, okay? Um, other complications include, you know, vessel penetration and stuff like that. Um, but uh, these are some, some of the main complications. Impar um, is the very bottom um, of, the, of, of the sympathetic chain and it innervates uh, the pelvic organs and, uh, well, I wouldn't say the pelvic organs, but the external genitalia, this area over here. So for patients with um, CRPS due to trauma or due to surgical complications, this is a good block to do. 
Again, repeated blocks are needed in order to achieve duration, okay? Okay, now, I'm gonna talk about radio frequency ablation. Um, radio frequency ablation is something that you could do if you're not getting long-term relief with the sympathetic block. I'm still blocking the sympathetic chain over here, but I'm going to use heat or other modalities to shut it down for a longer period of time. I don't typically like to do these because one, insurance generally don't pay for these things and there are complications that's associated with it and uh, I can show you why. Um, so these needle tips are um, a little bit larger than the sympathetic block needles. They're 20 gauge and you have to put it in front of the vertebral body, um, same way you do the injections, but you have to burn a strip lesion because not everybody's sympathetic chain lies at the same anatomical location. Um, a lot of my patients have extra pain um, that's associated uh, with this procedure um, and their efficacy is, is okay. As in, they, they get about 50% relief but the duration is good but they don't get as much um, percentage of relief as the blocks. Um, blocks because I use a very strong solution, um, it really helps. But um, I typically don't do these as much um, because of those complications. But um, I just want to show you there is one way to shut down the sympathetic chain um, without proceeding to some of the more advanced techniques. It's been described in textbooks. I'm sharing that with you, but it's not something I do typically in my practice right now. Okay. Let's quickly mention peripheral nerve blocks. Now, notice I'm not blocking the sympathetic nervous system anymore. I'm blocking the periphery, um, which innervates the nerves that's going to um, the site of injury. Now, again, it's been shown in literature that these blocks are useful in management of CRPS, but I typically don't do that. I mention it because it is a modality I have to talk about. Um, the problem is, imagine sticking a CRPS patient in their CRPS limb, not fun, okay? Um, you can cause more nerve injury, which may cause CRPS, so it becomes a catch-22. Um, and uh, it's, it's sort of frowned upon even in most of the interventional pain worlds to do peripheral nerve blocks. So try not to get, try not to do uh, sciatic and brachial plexus blocks because they, they're, they are, um, it may cause more damage than it's worth. But yes, sciatic and brachial plexus block has been shown to be efficacious in certain early CRPS syndromes. It's not indicated for late CRPS. Now, beer blocks is something I have done before. Um, it does not involve direct injection into the nerves of the affected limb. This is a sciatic nerve block. This is a brachial plexus block for upper extremity, lower extremity. Beer blocks is when you actually place a IV into the affected limb and you, you tourniquet somebody's limb. Then you inject a low uh, or, or high volume, low concentration local anesthetics like Novocaine and you let it marinate for about 30 minutes. Now, the problem with that is, does it work? Absolutely, it has worked for um, patients who are not candidates for other type of injection, so suppose Patients are on blood thinners, right? You cannot do spinal injections for. This is a good salvage therapy for CRPS, but I don't like to do them as much because one, most people is not gonna even let, tolerate an IV in their CRPS limb. Not to mention I have to put another IV, I generally have to sedate them, so I put in an IV on the other hand or other non-CRPS limb. I sedate them, then I have to do the beer block. So technically challenging, a little bit more um, um, uh, definitely way more uncomfortable for the patients. I mention it because it can be used as a salvage therapy, but it, this is not sort of the things I like to do um, with regards to interventions. Does that make sense so far? Okay. Let's talk about epidural infusions, okay? Epidural infusion involves treating more centrally now. So remember, peripheral nerve blocks treats more peripherally, sympathetic blocks treats more peripherally, so early CRPS, early CRPS, now we're talking about modulating the spinal cord in the brain. So this works for early CRPS, this works for late CRPS because you're working at the level of the spinal cord to reduce sensitization, okay? Now, infusions is done with catheters. 
like these over here. When I was at the university setting, I have done that for some of my patients. Um, this is for short-term infusion, so you can admit the patient if the insurance approved it. You can place the catheter, you can run uh, local anesthetic and um, clonidine, or um, you can put opioid inside if you want to um, for about three to five days. I typically do it for five days. During that time, the patient is getting physical therapy. So patient's arm will feel great at that time, and you, you manipulate the arm as much as you can to prevent atrophy and get the mobilization started. This is actually a pretty good technique. Um, I really like it, but since I'm more limited to outpatient now, it's just not feasible for me to admit somebody to the hospital to do this. I've done it a few times for some of my patients here. Um, they got pretty good relief for about three to six months or reduced their flares down um, quite a bit. Now, this is a longer term infusion. This is like a port. Now, some of you guys may have ports for ketamine infusions or for long term use. This is like a chemo port. Um, that you can put in, but this is, a epi for, uh, this is an infusion not placed IV, but like an epidural uh, catheter. If you have insurance that's willing to pay for long-term infusion, like for up to six weeks, you can come into the clinic once a week or once every three days just to get an injection of local anesthetic into the port. It's kind of like a longer duration of infusion that you can do. Or if you have home health care services that can do this infusion for you in you know for six to eight weeks um, we did it when I was at fellowship where we had tunneled catheters um, for patients like this and uh, their CRPS got a lot of, a lot better um, they a lot of patients did not need implantable devices um, their functionality it was dramatically improved with this but again this is more of a insurance issue right now um, I think this is actually a pretty good modality to do I, I really like it personally but it's more uh, limited due to insurance and you know um, logistics and things like that. Um, so usually a very low dose of local anesthetics. So I, you know, when I was uh, doing it at UT, I was using 0.125 percent bupivacaine. Um, you do not want to use high concentration because you'll just drop the limb. You can't mobilize it or do anything. So um, I usually use. Uh, 0.125% bupivacaine or 0.2% ropivacaine with or without uh, you know, clonidine. And the clonidine is usually two mics per cc. Um, clonidine reduces the sympathetic activity and I found that to be beneficial. Um, but that is also depending on the patient too. So if you are on heart medicines or you have heart conditions, I generally do not put people on clonidine epidurally because it can reduce their heart rate, can cause bradycardia. Um, so you can run plain local and you guys will do just as great, okay? It's, um, this is just called um, um, epidural infusions, um, either short term or long term, okay? Obviously for long term, I'm not gonna send you home on an externalized catheter, you're just asking for infection and you can't do that. So this is for short term. Short term is for inpatient use only. This is what I do if your insurance will pay for outpatient infusions, right? So you put in a port, and then you would, you would come as outpatient for local anesthetic infusions, or you can bolus it in. Um, I have some success in treating cancer patients with it, because cancer pain is actually indicated reason to do these ports for terminal cancer. Um, but CRPS patients, insurance generally deny it, to be very honest with you, but it is a valuable therapy uh, to do. So I'm gonna quickly talk about spinal cord stimulation and uh, dorsal column stimulation. Like I said, it's working more on the spinal cord and on the brain level, right? So we're no longer talking about the peripheral nervous system, we're trying to change the central nervous system in order to control CRPS. Thus, it's useful in early CRPS or late CRPS. Now, it's useful in patients that had blocks before, but without duration extension on, um, on either the infusions or the blocks themselves. Um, how many of you guys have spinal cord stimulators already? Okay. Oh, wow, that's quite a bit of you guys. Okay. Um, so you guys probably know that you have to, you know, you guys go in for a trial phase where two temporary electrodes are inserted in your spinal column. Uh, the pain physician will turn it on and test and try to cover the area of your pain. Um, if the greater than 50% relief, then you can implant it um, 
the device for long-term management. Um, stimulation works by blocking the large fibers which transmit sensory information and um, I'm, I'm sorry, spinal cord stimulator, when you stimulate the large fibers, um, it prevents the small pain fibers from s synchronizing or uh, interfacing with the spinal cord. So this is called the Melzack and Wall gate theory. Um, I like to give an example of that. Sometimes it's hard for patients to understand why spinal cord stimulations work. Now, imagine you are on an interstate highway. That's the best analogy. Um, you're going either northbound or you're going southbound. The traffic do not cross each other because we have a median, right? Northbound traffic goes to your brain. Southbound traffic goes to your peripheral tissues. Spinal cord stimulator, what it does is it only blocks northbound traffic by using electricity to set up a roadblock, just like any, uh, anybody who's doing construction work on the highway, they put up roadblocks, right? So what happens when you put a roadblock on the highway? All the traffic before the roadblock gets slower, right? And then what's behind a roadblock, or I'm sorry, what's in front of the roadblock, there's less cars going through on the north side, therefore you see less signals, therefore less pain. So that's how, what the Melzack and Wall gay theory is. If you turn on stimulation for the large fibers, you functionally create a roadblock to not let the cars or the pain signals travel in the highway, therefore less pain is perceived in the brain, causing pain relief. Does that kind of make sense to everybody? Okay. Now, I like to say something about the stimulators. Um, there are many brands out there. Um, there are many doctors that programs differently. Um, I am it honestly, initially not very impressed with spinal cord stimulation for CRPS patients in general. Why, how many of you guys had a great trial that over two years lost coverage or have tolerance or had new development of pain? Okay, so with spinal cord stimulation, when CRPS spreads sometimes, you may not get coverage or some people do not get complete coverage with their pain? Or how many of you guys have the hypersensitivity got improved with the stimulation, but you guys still have deep bony pain, or every time when you move, you guys still hurt? Yeah, a lot of you guys. That's with traditional stimulation. So I honestly did not like this modality for my CRPS patient a couple of years ago, because you can implant somebody, they have a great trial initially, then over time they lose coverage or efficacy over time. I wasn't impressed. In fact, people at two years has lost a lot of coverage um, where they said, I feel the vibrations, but I don't have pain relief. It's, it's much more true for CRPS patients. Now, there are other reasons why this therapy could fail. One, the lead can move. There is increased pain in battery side. I don't know how many of you have a huge battery uh, um, in the back and that area hurts. You can have therapy tolerance, so that's when you have the stimulation, but you, you don't have the pain relief. Or you have the spread of disease beyond the area of coverage, where initially the doctors were trying to cover one area of pain, but over the course of the years, the CRPS has spread, and no longer you're getting as, um, as much efficacy as you needed to. Okay. Um, right, I, 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 would, I would kind of agree with that. Um, if, it's, if you have a lot of spine, like anatomical issues, you mean, or what? Like, yeah, if you have anatomical issues, the placement may be harder, um, and it may, be, it may be harder to get to the area of, of, of need, but um, if you have a lot of stenosis, where it, it may make a pain doctor uh, placement very hard, then I wouldn't do it, because you don't want to... Uh, you know, shove two leads in an area that's very, very tight because it can cause nerve compression and additional pain. Um, but over the course of the years, uh, there are better technology that's, that's coming around now, okay? So fast forward to two years ago when companies like Abbott, Boston Scientific, and Medtronic is trying to solve some of these problems of 
lead migration, increased pain at the battery site. Um, they, made, uh, they made leads and anchors that can anchor really well, so lead migration is a lot less now. Increased pain at battery site, everybody's making smaller batteries. Um, you know, Medtronic has an Intellis battery, which is really, really small. Um, and then um, Stimwave has, a, has literally no batteries. It's just one lead um, that you can use, so there's no insertional pain at the site. Now, these two things are harder to solve, right? Therapy tolerance, as in you're getting coverage, but you're not getting pain relief. This is also very hard to solve because this is more patient issues. This is more device issues that the companies can make better. But what do you do when you have therapy tolerance? Therapy tolerance means you know, you're getting coverage but not pain relief. Or the pain relief is no longer adequate to cover the area. So what I found out is traditional stimulation with these older waveforms where you're doing these large square waves where the stimulator is jolting you at this high of an amplitude, typically people develop problems over time. So older systems, you feel the vibrations and you feel the stimulation is when people are using tonic settings. Tonic settings means um, you know, higher energy level square wave. Over time, we have developed new waveforms that is a lot shallower. Notice the waveform in A is really, really tall. In B, it's way smaller. So the amount of electricity produced by these batteries to stimulate your nerves is a lot smaller. I think especially in CRPS patients, you need smaller waveforms. You do not need as much electricity firing at the battery as opposed to um, these older waveforms over here. High frequency is something that recently came up. Patients do generally really well initially, but over time they still have issues. So what I found out as people who have stimulators right now, this is what I recommend. If your stimulator is no longer working or working less or you're in a flare, turn it down, have the rep change your programming, give your body a little break, and then turn it back on in 48 to 72 hours, okay? Because that will reset your spine and your spinal nerves. Remember back in my first slide um, with the mechanism, what is CRPS? There's central sensitization, right? Your spinal nerves and your spinal cord is already very sensitive to stimulation. If you use more electricity, it may make it worse. So I, I may have some patients that said, hey, spinal cord stimulation never worked because when they turned it on, it made my CRPS worse. I have s some people that have said that to me before, okay? DRG is one of the newer techniques with spinal cord stimulation that I have found a lot of success with because the placement is no longer in the middle of the spinal cord where there are a lot of spinal fluids. So the energy consumption of the battery is a lot less. Therefore, a lot of my patients are doing really, really well. Remember that I said that high energy consumption batteries, patients generally don't do well. Low energy consumption batteries or new waveforms that allows smaller discharges in the battery has better pain relief. So that's one um, sort of corollary I've found after treating uh, patients with neuromodulation, with stimulation, with regards to spinal cord stimulators. Okay. Um, do anybody have any questions on the stimulation stuff? Okay, got it. I'll, I'll be quick about that. Um, I'm going to really quickly talk about the spinal cord uh, drug delivery system. Um, instead of um, using electricity to stimulate the central nervous system to cause pain relief, we use medications. Okay? So this is a pain pump, or some of you guys may have heard it. Same thing, you do a trial phase by using a single injection. And then if you have greater than 50% relief, you can implant a more permanent system. Pain pumps is indicated for people that have failed stimulation or patients who are not candidates for stimulation because of previous surgeries, difficulty in placement um, in some cases. Pain pump involves uh, a device here with a catheter that's inserted in the back of the spine to deliver medications. 
Um, there are three FDA-approved medications for pain pump delivery. One is morphine, one is baclofen, and one is ziconotide. Morphine has been used for the longest time. Again, they work for patients, but over time, just like any opioid, you develop tolerance. So over time, you need higher and higher doses. So I typically try not to do as more, many morphine pumps for my CRPS patients um, um, as compared to the other two. Baclofen is a good choice for patients with a lot of dystonia, with a lot of contractures in their hands and their legs. Um, they're useful in managing CRPS patients uh, with, with, with more limb mobility and spasticity and things like this. Ziconotide is actually one newer medicine. Um, it's actually nerve pain medicine that's not an opioid or a muscle relaxer. I have a lot of success with ziconotide. It really reduces the, uh, uh, the, uh, the nerve pain as well as um, some of the deeper pains. Um, again, small case studies on CRPS patients only, but I have trialed patients with other nerve pain conditions as well, and everybody has been doing phenomenally well. Now, the downside about placing a pump is, one, you're not using electricity anymore, you're using a chemical, aka a pump, this pump needs to be refilled at, at, at regular intervals for this medicine, uh, for this therapy to work. So patients are more tied down to me, right? With stimulation, if patients have a device that's placed, they generally do not come and see me that often because as long as the device is working and patients are well programmed and on good settings, they don't see me for, for a year or six months. This device kind of ties the patient down to a pain clinic. So whenever you're out of medications, uh, whenever the pump runs out, the pain physician has to refill it with the same medication. So it's definitely a lot more cumbersome to manage, but do they work? Yes. Um, Ziconotide or morphine or baclofen all have a role in managing CRPS. Okay. Um, so challenging to spinal delivery, like I already said, um, the pump head needs to be replaced. Um, it requires monthly but quarterly visits for pump refills. There are more potential complications because I am inserting catheter into the spinal canal and the spinal fluid, so you can have a persistent spinal headache, and you can have granuloma formation at the catheter site, which means that um, you know, there are scar tissue that can form at the tip. And this is a larger device, so there could be a lot more discomfort, but this is a salvage therapy for patients that has failed on stimulation or dorsal column stimulation. I'm gonna briefly talk about ketamine. I'm not, uh, I'm not gonna uh, mention as much because some of my other um, colleagues and my other faculties have mentioned it. It's used for an early and late CRPS as an adjunct to manage patients. If, especially when you have diffuse CRPS, when you have whole body CRPS, when there's no target for interventional pain management, because remember, everything I have talked about before requires a target. If you have CRPS in the limb, you put the catheter up in the limb, you do sympathetic block where the limb is. Um, if you have whole body CRPS or the entire body is on fire, there is no direct target I can use to do interventional pain management on, then I resort to ketamine infusion. Uh, great modalities in my late CRPS patient who has systemic symptoms. Um, you would run a series of, uh, of infusions followed by physical therapy, and patients do get better, like what Dr. Stetson has said. So I'm pretty impressed with this modality overall for my late CRPS patients. Um, just like what the pharmacist has mentioned, I'm not gonna beat this to death. Ketamine is an anesthetic. It, it can be used as an anesthetic or an analgesic. It does have side effects. If you run higher dose of ketamine, you can run into um, hallucinations. If people have seizure disorder, that you can precipitate seizures. If you have heart conditions, it will make your heart go fast and then you may have you know, exacerbated atrial fibrillation or other uh, tachycardia syndrome. So you wanna run it in a controlled setting. Uh, the dose is dependent on the patient, okay? Um, some patients, can tolerate a very high dose based on what kind of medical condition they have. Some patients cannot tolerate a high dose, but ketamine is dose dependent. So I feel like higher the dose, longer the duration of relief. In my personal opinion, most of my infusions get about three to six months on, on average. Um, 
with the adequate dosing. If your dose is low, you only get a couple of weeks of relief on some of my patients. Um, it's, it's supposed to not be a CRPS cure, but more of a salvage therapy for flares or for patients who are, who are in intractable pain. It has to be used with other modalities like nutrition, physical therapy, diet, and other things. Does that make sense so far? Okay, I already mentioned all of this stuff. So, multimodal management is key in success. Even though I'm relegated to talk about all the stuff I do with needles or, or infusions, notice I'm, I am over here. I am not in the center of this algorithm. The center of this algorithm is conservative management with medications, um, self-help, wellness, with physical therapy, okay? I'm on this side. When this pathway does not work or is unable to push through with physical therapy or you're, you guys are in a lot of pain, then you guys can use me as a resource to help you get through it. You still have to do therapy, you still have to do range of motion, you still have to self-help and control your microinflammation because that's one way to get the CRPS under control. I agree with Dr. Stetson that you should treat the underlying cause, um, treat the microinflammation, um, treat the disuse, the atrophy. If you treat all of those things, you guys have a chance for the CRPS to be in remission. Now, I'd like to briefly mention psychological treatments, okay? Psychological treatments are important because if you do not treat the depression or disuse syndromes where people are just pain guarding, they, they have been in so much pain, they're fearful of using the limb, that you need some psychological intervention to reduce fear, reduce anxiety, so the patients can rehab, okay? Now, I'm not gonna do spoiler alert. Uh, I'm, I'm a lot younger than Dr. Sesson is. I'm definitely a big Marvel uh, uh, comic book fan and DC Universe, uh, but I like to illustrate a point, okay? Use all of us to help you. Pharmacists, um, you know, interventional specialists, um, practitioners who does conservative management to all help. Not one of us can help you beat the boogie bear, okay? You guys need all of us to help and we can beat it all together and, to, and that's what's giving you guys hope, okay? That's pretty much all I got.